Um, so up next, uh, we have Dr. Andrew Burke, uh, who is a dual specialist in both infectious diseases and thoracic medicine at the Prince Charles Hospital in Brisbane. Uh, he has diverse clinical experience working in low income countries as well as regional Australia. His research focuses on non-tuberculous mycobacteria and inhaled GM-CSF for pulmonary NTM infection. He leads the pharmacokinetic substudies in the FORMAT trial uh, and is a co-investigator on the ASCOT study. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Thanks, Holly. So thanks uh, for joining us. I know some of you are joining from around the world. I know some will be listening to this uh, at a later date. Uh, so I'm going to talk about therapeutic drug monitoring. And so I'm really going to base this on uh, clinical cases. And this is really, you know, Australia is obviously, you know, a well-resourced country financially. And I appreciate some of you attending from other parts of the world may not have access to these drug assays that we're using. But Jan Willem is going to talk in the third, uh, third talk of the evening about maybe how we can make this technology and concepts more accessible. The rough outline of my, my talk today, I thought I'd just give a, um, a quick talk about uh, ACNET if I can. So we're grateful for the opportunities to co-sponsor co this talk this evening. So I'm chair of the steering committee for ACNET and it's uh, the idea is it's a, a network of clinicians who are interested in TB research and we you can see our partners down the bottom. And the idea is that you know, TB research in Australia, New Zealand, it's not a, a big group of people, but it's important that we all get to know each other. So this, this is a forum for that and we're trying to engage in more educational op opportunities uh, over the next few years as well as supporting research. So if you are interested, you can go to this, um, to this uh, website. So I'm on the Therapeutic Guidelines Committee um, and I had the uh, privilege of co-writing the uh, TB, updating the TB guidelines for the current edition. And most people like TB because the dosing's fairly straightforward, it would seem. And most of us will go to this, this table and we look at the patient's weight and whether it's daily or, or intermittent therapy. And the dosing seems fairly straightforward. And uh, for therapeutic guidelines, we have Google Analytics and we can see what people click on because it's all electronic now. And this is a, a very uh, popular um, heading to, to click on. So one question many of you will have coming to this talk is, well, why should we do TDM when we generally have very good outcomes in TB? And certainly when you look at Australia, for susceptible, fully susceptible pulmonary TB, we probably have a 99% cure rate. So that's with the dosing, uh, the doses that you can see on the screen. But if you look at where these doses came from, they really developed before a good knowledge of pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics had been established. And the studies were done in Hong Kong and Southern India in the 1950s and 60s. And there's a lot of question marks about some of the doses that we use. And that's been borne out in some, in some clinical practice. The sort of uh, drug assays that we have available in, in Queensland um, are here. And I was grateful for our Pathology Queensland. They're the laboratory who support the public health system in, in Queensland or, or public system in Queensland. And they've been excellent at establishing these, these assays, which are all welcome to use at any time, whether it be for clinical work or research. And just as a bit of a housekeeping issue, if you ever want to know what assays are available in Australia, you can go to the uh, Australasian Society for Antimicrobials, and there's a link here, and you can just type in the drug you're after, and they'll tell you who you can contact um, for the various drug assays. So I guess one question is, you know, as doctors are pretty good at doing lots of tests and biopsies and all sorts of procedures, but the question is, can it actually improve outcomes? Um, and obviously there's lots of TB drugs that we have, you know, four standard drugs we use in susceptible TB and Chris Coulter mentioned the, the large number in MDR and XDR-TB. So, you know, when should we measure drugs? Which ones do we measure? How do we measure them? Um, and ultimately, will it change management outcomes? And so just, uh, just for framing some of the, the, the thoughts about what drugs maybe we could think about doing TDM on. Well, for TB, some could be the most important drugs. So rifampicin and isoniazid tend to be the, the cornerstone drugs that we use. And then we've also got those drugs which may have a uncertain therapeutic window. So linezolid is one that springs to mind. And now the WHO for, uh, is suggesting long-term linezolid for MDR and XDRTB. So much longer than we've traditionally felt comfortable with. And TDM may have a role in, um, in managing some of the risk for that. Levofloxacin maybe doesn't have the same type of therapeutic window, but nevertheless, there are dosing uncertainties. So levofloxacin is most commonly used globally, although moxifloxacin is also, is also uh, used as well. And moxifloxacin is what we tend to use more commonly in Australia. And amikacin, 
We don't tend to use so much now in MDRTB, but we still use it in NTM. I'm not going to talk about uh, amikacin in this talk, just in the interest of time. So I thought I'd just talk uh, a few cases, really, just to get us um, all thinking. So this is a 57-year-old man who had TB, HIV co-infection. Uh, CD4 count was 120, so he met the criteria for AIDS. Um, he was stands on, started on TB uh, therapy. And after about, he was outside of Brisbane, and after about 10 weeks, um, he just really, with well, three months, he was really culture positive. And he wasn't thriving. He's, he's in hospital now for 12 weeks. And we, we got a phone call about whether we could help out with TDM. I think in Australia, we don't see as much advanced TB as other countries. So we have a good, you know, good GPs and good hospital doctors and public health physicians. And we tend to diagnose TB uh, earlier. And so I think we get a bit spoiled from that. Most of our TB patients uh, get better quite quickly. And then uh, every now and then we get somebody who isn't playing by the rules and is really taking a long time to get better. And we all start to, uh, to get nervous. So I'd just like you to keep in mind, it was 12 weeks before TDM was considered in this patient. And in fairness to those clinicians, uh, this is a year or two ago, we'd only had uh, the availability of TDM for probably a year at this stage. We've only had it in Queensland for a few years. So he had, um, he had uh, rifampicin level done. And I'm gonna talk in length, greater length in the next few slides uh, about another case. But the CMAX that we tend to aim for in, in rifampicin is about eight is the lower limit. And we generally do a two hours post dose. And you can see here that you know, his level is about 11. Um, the range we talk about is eight to 20, but by the time, so you might say at the lower limit of normal, low, or the lower range of normal. But um, by the time this result had got back, it actually started to get better. So I'd sort of suggest in this case, if we were going to do TDM, we probably should, the, the time to do that was probably much earlier in his treatment uh, period. I'm going to talk a bit in a bit more detail about a similar, uh, similar sort of concepts, but we had more detailed uh, drug levels done. So this is a 63-year-old man. We didn't really have any major risk factors for cavitry or, or for TB at all. Hadn't traveled overseas. He was a smoker, had been a bit of a drinker. And when he came in, he, he really had, he was quite sick from tuberculosis. He had cavitry disease. Uh, he'd lost quite a lot of weight um, and was really sort of borderline uh, low weight. And he, he was smear positive, which means he had a high bacterial burden. And he was commenced on standard therapy on New Year's Day this year at our hospital. And was under our res one of the respiratory teams. I've just made a bit of a graph here of what we call this smear positivity. So Chris spoke a lot about the molecular uh, aspects, but we still do look at people's what we call smear status. And for those of you who may not be, I you know there's a lot of pharmacists here who are interested in this and may join us. So when someone's smear three plus, that's really looking at how many bacteria we can see in a high powered field. And so this would be you know, three plus now we use fluorescent staining more commonly. And then when someone's smear negative, it means that they've got a very uh, low bacterial burden. But this is now, you know, nine weeks or so into therapy, he's still got a very high rate of bacteria seen under the microscope. And importantly, he was still culture positive. So this is now extending into March. And so we were, infectious disease were contacted and we, among other things, uh, the question was, why is he not getting better? He's got susceptible TB. Uh, we know he's taking his drugs. He's been in the hospital all this time. And so TDM was done. So at week eight, I've just showed you for, as a, some reference slides here on the right, about the sort of rough dosing that we expect for rifampicin and isoniazid. And for rifampicin, he was on the standard dosing, but at two hours post, he had a very, very low, um, I don't think I can have a, a pointer, but um, you can see here in that slide, he's got a very low, a very low level, okay? And likewise for isoniazid, a very low level as well. And perhaps he was a rapid acetylator, but even acknowledging for that, his levels are much lower than we would, we would want and well below target. And so I guess it's plausible that one of the reasons he was so slow to respond is because of sub-therapeutic levels. We increased his dose, so his rifampicin went from 600 to 900 and isoniazid increased uh, 450. And this was a bit of a, just a, a bit of a guess, I guess I made, let's increase the dose by 50% and then repeat the levels. And you can see here, his levels are still very low. So this, the only, the only TDM we're doing here is that a Cmax, which for rifampicin and isoniazid is two hours post. So now we've increased his dosing further. So we're now up to double the dose for rifampicin and double the first line dose for isoniazid. And on this occasion, we did hourly bloods over eight hours. And we did this in the form of a research uh, because we do PK studies in mycobacteria. So we signed a consent form. And um, uh, one of the questions was, well, are we, is that two hour level, is that really capturing his peak? Um, and maybe we'll get some more detailed pharmacokinetic snapshot. So you can see here that 
the two hour mark here, that it's suggesting the literature, the two hour time point did in fact capture his CMAX. You can see now he's got a nice high level. This is now on 1200 milligrams a day. And likewise, you can see his isoniazid, um, you know, his peak was a little bit earlier than the C2 would have captured, but we're still in the ballpark. And even the C2 here would have had a level of six, but not too, uh, not too far off what his, his true peak is. So we felt we were getting reasonable levels uh, with that. We also measured his ethambitol. Um, his ethambitol levels were actually not too bad and we didn't dose adjust that. Uh, interestingly, ethambitol is not metabolized, it's, it's renal clearance. So maybe, maybe there's an issue here with his hepatic met, uh, metabolism, which is why he was uh, having low levels of both ethambitol and isoniazid, with, which are metabolized. One important point for ethambitol is that the Cmax is three hours and not two hours. So we do, we do uh, suggest uh, a later time point for that. So this is just looking at his culture positivity here. So you might remember we started his TDM at week eight. And look, he did become culture negative shortly after that. And I'd say probably even before we had increased his doses, probably in retrospect, maybe he was going to be culture positive anyway, but then he became smear positive again. So I've only shown you one time, one smear result for each week here, but he'd had probably you know, he's getting three sputum samples a week here and it had, in week 10, it had three smear, smear negative uh, results. But then he became smear positive again and the concern was he was getting drug resistant TB. But in fact, when the, Chris's laboratory got back to us, he actually had a non-tuberculous mycobacteria, uh, mycobacterium mucogenicum. So this is maybe a, a topic for another day, but it had this uh, non-tuberculous mycobacteria had sort of evolved while on uh, TB treatment. And the reasons for that are, we can sort of speculate. But uh, if you're in a, a low and middle income country and you couldn't, speciate these mycobacteria, you would have perhaps treated him as MDR, XDR, TB if you were in a, in a low resource setting where you couldn't have uh, culture results. And this is the CT scan, just showing we don't normally do CTs, but uh, you can see for TB, but you can see how, how dense that consolidation was. So if you look at isoniazid variability here, this is a, a paper recently out of China. Um, and you know, we talk about faster satellites and slower satellites. And there's a genotype called the uh, N-acetyltransferase uh, 2 genotype. And there's quite a strong correlation here with isoniazid level. And we can divide people up into faster satellites who are gonna have low levels and, um, and, and slower satellites who have higher levels. So the slower, level, slower satellites are gonna have a higher isoniazid, which is more bactericidal, which is good, but high rates also of, of drug-related hepatitis. And certainly in PK modeling, they've suggested in this Chinese population that you probably need double the isoniazid dose uh, to, to potentially get the, um, the, the sort of uh, drug levels that, that you'd like. We don't, in Australia, we can't check for N NAT2 genotype. You can send it away to America. There is, uh, there's recently been a study published looking at gene expert uh, have developed a cartridge which measures your, uh, records your NAT2 genotype. So this is not commercially available. Chris spoke about uh, gene expert um, molecular methods for drug susceptibility, and now we may have it for, for genotype uh, for patient uh, you know, individ individualized treatment outcomes, which would be great. So this might be something we can do down the track, but obviously doing the therapeutic drug monitoring also, I guess, captures that genotypic variability. This is a Japanese group where they found that um, what your, um, whether you gave genotype related guided therapies, if you knew their acetylation status beforehand, uh, versus just guessing the dose, giving everyone 300, we actually had lower, lower rates of, of liver injury if you could record somebody's uh, acetylation status before or after, before starting treatment. And we don't have that in Australia, and this is just a research tool, but it might be something we need to, uh, to consider because 10% of our patients, we need to stop TB treatment because of LFT arrangements at some stage. So I'm going to move on to MDR TB now. This is a patient uh, managed by Dr. Tim Baird and Theong at Sunshine Coast University Hospital, just north of Brisbane. So it's a 21 year old man, Papua New Guinea national. Uh, he presented with uh, abdominal discomfort and anorexia and it's febrile. And on examination, he had signs of right heart uh, failure. So he had this jugular venous pressure or JVP was high and um, you know, he was quite unwell. And on his x-ray here, you can see that he's got a very big heart, which is actually pericardial fluid and bi bilateral pericardial effusions. And he actually had what we call cardi cardiac tamponade so that the, the amount of fluid around his heart was actually compressing his ventricle. So he also had, uh, and you can see here on the right, you can see the, um, the fluid around the heart and the, the bilateral uh, effusions. 
So we had a pericardial window done. So it was drained uh, by the cardiologist. And this is even within a few days, he's, he's drastically improved even before uh, TB therapy had had a chance to work. Now, Chris went on and spoke to us about some of the molecular aspects. And he had a gene expert done, which was positive, suggesting he had MDR-TB. And uh, you see here his mutation analysis on the right. So if we look at his um, guy rays there, G-Y-R-A there in the, that right-hand box, he had a, it was associated with um, moxifloxacin or quinolone resistance. But when we did his, when Chris Coulter's lab did the high and low dose moxifloxacin, you see with high dose moxifloxacin, there was an SS suggesting he was, it was some degree of susceptibility. We'd also done some TDM around the same time or suggested that. So he had moxifloxacin levels and they were relatively low. And his lanesla levels uh, were, were high. And I'm going to talk about lanesla in more detail later on. So on the basis of his TDM, his lanesla dose was decreased, but his moxifloxacin dose was increased to 800 milligrams daily. And that was partially to try and uh, overcome this guy raised mutation. So I thought this was a nice marrying of both the uh, molecular diagnostics and, and susceptibility testing, as well as our therapeutic drug monitoring. So with quinolones, they're, they're a key role in MDRTB. They're less effective in NTM. And with uh, globally, levofloxacin is more commonly used. It's cheaper, it's not metabolized, and there's fewer drug interactions. But, and we can get in Australia through the special access scheme. Uh, we tend to use moxifloxacin more so in Australia just for, for, for ease. However, there is some um, interaction with rifampicin. So if you are you, you know, using it in, say, um, you wouldn't usually use it if someone's rifampicin resistance, obviously, but in NTM, there might be times when you do that. Um, and the optimum dose is not established, and we probably need to give a higher dose than we use in, in other infectious diseases. And gadifloxacin is no longer used. So look, there is a quite marked quinolone uh, PK variability, and this, these bars are just showing the sort of different ranges that you might see. Um, and there can be a nine-fold variation. So quinolones work on an AUC MIC target. We roughly look around about greater than 100, although there's uh, you know, variations around that. Some have suggested higher to decrease resistance. And the WHO suggests considering um, quinolone TDM if the MIC is greater than 0.25, and if you're giving rifampicin co-medication, because rifampicin will lower the dose of moxifloxacin, but uh, not levofloxacin. So I think James Geek might be attending tonight. So this is a patient, I'm uh, gonna talk about Lanesla TDM for a moment. Um, this is the first time I'd really given, uh, use Lanesla TDM, and this is a patient of James's who had a bacteria I must admit never heard of, Mycobacterium thermoresistible. Uh, very, only, I think, two cases in the literature. And as a 35-year-old man, he was in ICU actually for quite a prolonged time with respiratory failure. And on the left-hand side, um, I'm not sure if you can see my, my, my pointer, but his esophagus is very dilated. It had perhaps achalasia or some, some you know, reflux uh, or aspiration, which might have predisposed him to this. And you see how terrible that CT looked. So there was very few drug options for him. And so it was decided to give lanesolid and we were able to treat him for three months of lanesolid and Subsequently, the WHO has recommended it for longer for MDRTB, but I think we're a bit out of our comfort zone for this fellow. He was very, very sick. But having TDM, I think, did give us that confidence uh, to push on for a longer course. If you look at the um, distribution of lanesolid, so we gen generally they say aiming for a trough level of less than two, okay? Uh, or a trough level, I should say, between about you know, two, and, two and eight as your target range. Uh, in long-term use, a trough level of less than two uh, tends to be safer, but obviously there's a trade-off there for your, um, you know, whether you're going to re reach your target PK, uh, PD uh, index, which I'll mention in a moment. So I think we worry about lanesla toxicity, but generally if you look at this, this scatter graph here, and this is in patients uh, who were treated for soft tissue and osteoarticular infections with prolonged lanesolid, you see more often than not, we're actually underdosing people with lanesolid. So we often worry about toxicity for things like aminoglycosides, valenezolid, but oftentimes we're going to be underdosing. So that's often just as important to pick up as, as overdosing. And although there's no dose adjustment suggested in, in the product insert for valenezolid or in the Australian Medicine Handbook, certainly we know that there is a, a dose adjustment probably required in, in people with renal impairment. And if your GFR is less than 30, you probably need to, well, I think I would recommend halving the dose and TDM might be indicated there as well. So if you look at the, the rates of lanesolid toxicity, so I guess the main study using lanesolid was the Zephyr study, looking at MRSA, nosocomial pneumonia, but this was for relatively short durations. Um, and I think the median time was about 10 days on therapy. 
And so the relatively low dose, low rates of thrombocytopenia and, and, uh, and renal impairment and so forth. But a longer term therapy, and we classically see this in mycobacterial infection, and MDRTB, you know, thrombocytopenia, myelosuppression, optic and peripheral neuropathy, lactic acidosis, these all become uh, relatively common. And so I think Linezla TDM, uh, I think has a strong role here. So you might recall I said that we're looking at the trough level and that generally probably between two and five is probably a reasonable trough level, at least for the first few months. But for Linezla, the, the AUC is really the key uh, PK um, index, which is determining uh, you know, how bacteriocidal or bacteriostatic it is. So one of the good things about this slide is that if you just look at the AUC 100 column, first of all, but the, your trough concentration correlates very well with the area under the curve. So I don't think you really need to do multiple levels. If Ian Willem's got a different thoughts to me, but I think a trough level for Linezlet is probably satisfactory in the great majority of cases. For TB, the, the critical concentration for Linezlet is about an MIC of one, okay? So really an AUC MIC ratio of, of uh, 100 um, is probably gonna be fine. And so a ratio of a trough level of two to five for MDRTB is likely to be satisfactory. If you're going to use linezolid in mycobacterium abscessus, it's going to be a higher, you probably need higher targets. And so you might need to be going for a high trough level, excepting there may be a high degree of risk associated with that. So these are just two interesting cases for us at Prince Charles in the last couple of weeks. So this is a 69 year old Filipino lady and she had a positive gene expert uh, for TB and, a, and um, also consists with rifampicin resistance. So RPOB positive. So we started treating her as MDRTB while we waited for those susceptibility studies. The, the um, NICS-TB study, a uh, big study looking at linezolid and MDRTB use 1200 milligrams a day, usually in divided doses. So I started her on that. After about 14 days of treatment, her hemoglobin dropped uh, and I couldn't find another cause for this anemia. And she was actually quite unwell. She was starting to vomit. And I'd, I'd sent off a trough linezolid level after about seven days of therapy. In our, our laboratory, only do one run a week, usually on a Thursday or Friday. So what I tend to do is after a week of therapy, I'll do TDM for linezolid on everybody. And that way, if I do run the first, I can review that result. Even if they're well, I get that result back. But also then by the time they're getting some complications, I've got something to reflect upon. Obviously, we're trying to avoid complications. So I withheld linezolid even before that level was back. Um, but it came back within a few days. And this level is very, very high. And you can see that, that uh, scatter graph on the right, you can see uh, that's really um, well into the toxic range. And clinically she was toxic with that. So I, I then lowered her dose to 600 daily after withholding it for about five days and um, repeating her level now is 5.5 and her hemoglobin had increased and she's tolerated that, that dose very well. So this is now two weeks later. There's a 57 year old woman from Tibet, um, MDRTB. And I'm a bit spooked at this stage because two weeks earlier I'd given some lady a of toxicity and so this time I, I started with a, a half dose or you know, 600 daily. Again, some of the studies would suggest using this dose. And the um, TB practical study, which has just been discussed but not yet published, they did use a lower dose of linezolid. Um, and she tolerated it well, but now her linezolid level is very, very low. So down to 1.1. So these are two women who, you know, within 10 years of each other in age, they're both slim women. You know, if you looked at these women in the corridor, you'd say they'd probably, they both need the same linezolid dosing. And yet they've got two very different uh, levels. One, uh, I was toxic initially, but when I brought her down to 600, her steady state concentrate, concentration was five. And this lady is 1.1. So she needed a dose uh, increase. So um, linezolid dosing, it's unclear what the optimum dose is. Um, 600 milligrams daily for TB probably does meet your AUC MIC target. Uh, bone marrow toxicity we worry about as it tends to be concentration driven and Peripheral neuropathy tends to be from cumulative exposure, so after more than a month of treatment. And in the next tb trial, at least 70% of patients with MDR-TB had at least one treatment interruption because of linezolid toxicity. So there's conflicting studies about the utility of TDM. I think, look, it's not expensive to do TDM. It's about $100. And I think, um, I think given the cost of these, the overall cost of treatment, I think it's warranted. This is a XDR cohort out of America, United States. And they had pretty high rates. You can see a peripheral neuropathy, optic neuropathy, myelosuppression. And basically everyone with a level of a trough level of over two, which isn't that high, had some degree of toxicity. And an important maybe point of difference for this group is that there's a high rate of diabetes you can see there. 
with you know 43% of those with toxicity having diabetes compared to 26% who didn't. So that's something to reflect upon and maybe about who we do TDM on. People have looked at uh, you know trying to come up with a magic formula, which there isn't one. But I think you know, and people are looking at different dosing, maybe you know nine to 1200 milligrams, but every second day or so as an alternate uh, dosing strategy. Uh, but I think there is enough evidence there to suggest we should do TDM on everyone who's on lanesolid for more than a couple of weeks. So just to summarize, um, oh, that's all from me. Um, yeah, that was fantastic, uh, Andrew. Yeah, thank you so much. There's a couple of questions. Um, should we, we could just quickly do a couple now because it's all about lin, the linazolid sure. PDM. And I'm also really interested uh, about all of that as well. So we've yep. got a couple of questions in the Q&A. Uh -huh. uh, is there any specific dose calculation when we have two levels of linazolid um, is one of the questions. The next one is when the linazolid was withheld for how many hours or days? Uh, or just decide based on half-life. And yeah, my question as well was going to be, um, yeah, like when, when do you start uh, monitoring linazolid over what duration after you've started it? So they all kind of feed into each other, those questions. So I'll just, I couldn't see, the, I'll get the questions up here. Um, any specific dose calculation of two levels? Um, so generally, I guess the first thing is your empirical dosing. And so for TB, there's been two main studies, the Nix TB study, which measured used 1200 milligrams. And the, the study which will be published coming up soon, the practical TB study used 600 milligrams. And the practical study had much lower rates of toxicity, which is a good thing. And they seem to have good outcomes for six months of therapy. Uh, there's no specific dose calculation that I can think of. Um, so, you know, I guess for that other lady, I withheld the drugs for, I think about four or five days. Um, because I was, you know, she was anemic. She was, you know, there was time to time to withhold that, and then I just started a, a half dose and then redid the level. So I don't have a dose calculator for that. I'm not sure if Ian Willem can maybe comment if he wishes. Um, and so I'm I'm just sort of learning as I go with these, as I think most of us are. For a therapy, um, is your orange red coloured urine side effect uh, correlated with serum famson concentration? Look. I've looked into that uh, and there was a, a study I found from the 1960s or 70s, which seemed to suggest that once you got over, um, so I've always thought, well, if your urine's turning red, maybe that suggests you've got a therapeutic level and it, it doesn't seem to, okay? So certainly um, that, that first, that patient I discussed at length at the very low levels, his urine was, was still red. It seems that once you're uh, on more than 300 milligrams a day, your urine usually turns red. Um, but it's an interesting question, and I haven't really seen anything in the literature, but Ian Willem might have other, other comments on it. Uh, Jason just made a comment to me, Jason Roberts. The first question might relate to an AUC calculator. Um, so you can do, you can, you can do a, make up an AUC. Uh, there's no Bayesian program I've seen for TB. Again, I can be corrected on that. Um, but I think trough levels are probably fine. I don't think we need to make it too complicated for an ESLED TDM, which is a good thing. So they're, they're very wishy-washy answers to very uh, questions I've thought a lot about, but sadly, I don't have a better answer. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Thank you so much, Andrew. That was really educational. Thanks, Holly. Um, so just before we move on to the final speaker, just on behalf of um, people coordinating the talk tonight, just wanted to thank our sponsors who are um, CRE Reduce, CHU Nimes, Pfizer, MSD, Gilead, and Baxter Healthcare as well. Um, so thank you so much for your support um, allowing us to proceed with this this evening.